started. We thank you, Father, for your word. And we thank you that you're a God of truth and that you'll only speak the truth. Help us to continue to be people who love the truth and follow the truth. Open our minds to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're in chapter 17 of Acts. And, and Paul, we're in the middle of Paul being speaking to uh, the Greeks at the Areopagus in uh, Athens. And that's where all of the debaters and whatnot would speak. And, and uh, they wanted to uh, hear what he had to say. And they didn't think much of his speaking ability. And that's something the Greeks loved was a very fluent speaker. In fact, when they judged people and determined who won a debate, they would always pick the one who had a fluent speaking, not the one who had the truth, not the one who had the right way, just, just so it sounded nice. And if you had the right conditional sentences throughout it and whatnot, they would, they would declare you the winner whether what you said was nonsense or not. Uh, here they want to know what Paul has to say because, uh, and Paul's the speaker, and um, in verse 29 we're going to pick it up, and Paul has talked about how, you know, God has uh, set us a place that we're going to live, and, and nations, their boundaries, and how long that nation would last. And he has placed us where we're at so that we would have a maximum opportunity to know God. And in verse 29, we pick it up there. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, which means change your mind. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And that's part of the resurrection, it's proof that God is going to judge and he will only accept truth uh, Jesus said to Pilate those who love the truth listen to me and Pilate been very political he said what is truth and walked away he knew truth he, he just didn't like the consequences of truth and um, when Paul mentions the raise of the dead that offends the Greeks because their philosophy, again, is that the body is evil. The soul inside the body is good. So when the body dies, that frees the soul from its prison. And it didn't matter whether you're Epicurean, which means eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. Now, they restricted that because they all knew that if you drank too much, you got a terrible headache hangover and whatnot. Uh, but nevertheless, they encourage people just to uh, imbibe and uh, go kind of wild, because if you died, oh well, you know, you're free in your body. And then there were the Stoics who said, now that's too excessive. And too many people get hurt and it hurts your body and you know, all kinds of things. So you should deny yourself things and restrict your body. And if it dies, that's okay, you get free. Either way, but they did not want to think that they're going to get a body back. Uh, they thought, well, well, that's that's a terrible thing. Get your body back when you finally get free of these restrictions of your body. But it's only, as the scriptures talk about it, uh, it's only in the body we can glorify God. Uh, he's given us a body to glorify God in time. Now. So when they heard about this resurrection, that bothers them. Of course, you know, the Holy Spirit is convicting them of truth. 
And even though they live in a system, philosophical system that's air, the Holy Spirit is convicting them of truth. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered because they had a philosophy, the body's bad. To get it back would be a bad thing. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. So, that's important. Um, I will stop right there and go to Isaiah 55. Isaiah chapter 55. It's an evangelistic message to the Jewish people. Uh, Seek the Lord while it may be found, verse 6 of chapter 55. Uh, call upon him when he, while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. And let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. And then the problem that we have. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That doesn't mean we can't understand His way of thinking, but His way of thinking is far superior to anything we can come up with. Even the great philosophers that we've known throughout history have ended up in dead ends. They couldn't figure it out. They just couldn't put it together no matter how hard they tried. Uh, and, uh, but God's known all about everything that we ever contemplate. And he knows all the answer. Uh, that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom, you better start with God. You have to. You leave God out of the equation and you'll never come to a conclusion. That's right. Uh, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Which means if you want to be smarter, if you want to have wisdom, you better, so to speak, drag Christ along in your life. He better be a part of it because uh, true insight and wisdom will come from Him. So anyway, um, my thoughts are higher than yours and my ways higher than yours uh, just as the heavens are higher than the earth and then illustration in verse 10 as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So the word of God is represented in the rain and snow that comes down. That's the illustration. That the word of God comes from God and it benefits our life. Just as when we get rain, it ben good crops can be produced. Now the only thing that's produced when it doesn't rain are weeds and thorns. They, they magically grow without any, you know, speak of uh, rain. Um, and he says, that's the way it is when the word comes out of my mouth. There's going to be a good production. Uh, and so Paul speaks to the unbelievers in Athens at the Areopagus. And some believe. God sends his word out and there's always going to be some who start to think, I think that's right. And uh, that's, that's how God saves people, by the message of the Word of God given. Uh, and uh, the message is about the Savior He sent, Jesus Christ, and He has raised, he, he died for our sins, He's raised from the dead to benefit us. And there will always be in a crowd of people, some who's, who are positive. You might not be able to tell it, but... Uh, Paul found this to be true in, in everywhere he went. Some of them believed. So it should be encouragement for us to uh, witness because some of them believe. 
Uh, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. So when the word of God, particularly the gospel message goes out, it's not going to have no effect. It's going to accomplish what God wants it to uh, and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Okay, that's good enough. Um, then the rest of the chapter is about the millennium, that the ultimate fruition of God's word is going to take place in the millennium. But let's go back to our Acts chapter 17. So, at that Paul left the council, some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. What is salvation? Belief. Believe in the message. Believing what God said, and God gives them eternal life. Among them, Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, that is a, a leading um, council in the city. A very important, uh, prominent man, and he becomes a believer. Now, generally speaking, when Paul spoke Hundreds of slaves believed when they had a chance to hear the message because that's the best thing they ever heard in their life. They had nothing, they were nothing, and there was no future. And then this message about Jesus Christ comes along and they've got everything. It makes a reason for them to do their job right. It gives them a reason to have hope and joy in their life. It gives them a reason for everything in life. And uh, and generally, a few intellectuals or uh, prominent people will believe. Usually the ones with the most education have the most difficulty because they're proud of their education. They're proud of, of their brain power and whatnot. And uh, because, you know, it, it takes a humbling of ourself to believe God's message and and to leave ourselves out of it. Well, I got a PhD and I did this and I accomplished that and I, I grew a great business and all that. And they're very proud of that. And they want credit for that. And God says, not anything we've done, lest anybody boast. It's strictly by God's grace. And, and many people find it very hard to humble themselves to say, okay, I believe God. Paul he had tremendous credentials and he said, all that stuff I used to have, I consider to be human dung compared to knowing Christ. Of course, he's very blunt about it. Um, also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So there was a response. You know, we think, well, did you have a very great uh, outpouring uh, of people who believe he did and it wasn't the biggest church in the area but it's kind of like going to the university and winning professors and that's what he did um, verse 18 or chapter 18 rather after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth now Corinth is fun city <laughs> It's a combination of Las Vegas, and I don't even know what else to say, New Orleans, you know, just, just party town. Uh, Corinth was a place where ships would land. They needed to go around the Isthmus, and, and later on, actually, Nero started them digging that little Isthmus a uh, few miles to cut a waterway through it because that would save them many many days in going around but in Paul's day the ships would land and they were headed for uh, Rome uh, they fed the whole of Italy uh, there's two things that after Hannibal marched for 17 years all over Italy and they couldn't do anything with him. He was a tremendous tactician. And his own people 
The Carthaginians never sent him any supplies and never sent him any reinforcements. And he held out for 17 years with all of the cities of uh, Italy locked up because they knew they couldn't face him in battle. And finally he left because Rome sent armies down to North Africa and he had to go down and rescue his own people who had neglected him. But uh, what happened to the uh, people in North Africa is, uh, well, excuse me, let's go back to Italy. Now, the people of Italy, they had farmers all over the place, you know, before Hannibal came and then nobody, everybody went into the cities where it was safe. And uh, they just sit around and, and Rome kept buying supplies, grain from Egypt, which was the breadbasket of the ancient world. And they kept buying it and uh, feeding the people. They kept all the people fed and they kept all the people entertained with their circuses, gladiator things and whatnot. And the people were happy. And so these guys went around and were asking the farmers, I hear you own some land, you want to sell it? And you know, like they've been out, out of, off their land for 15, 16 years, whatever. They said, what good is it to me? You know, I haven't been able to farm. It's going to take a lot to get it back in shape and all. And the citizens of Italy sold their land to a very few people who became the landowners. They were going to use slave labor for it. And the people of these different cities that sold their land they had no means of supporting themselves, so they just kept taking the free um, food and entertainment. Now, we wouldn't do that in this country. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a system of giving away food constantly, uh, and there's nothing wrong with being compassionate toward people, but giving people who don't work for her and giving them food and we all have TVs. Not just TVs, we make, government's gonna make sure we have cable, no matter where you are. And uh, we're fairly like that. Just keep us fed and entertained, and we won't, we won't, you know, give you any trouble. Well, Corinth was a very important stopover for all these ships. The ships, the Roman ships, rarely sailed in the open sea. It was just too dangerous. They weren't that good of sailors. They learned to sail because a Carthaginian ship ran aground one day, and the Roman drunk said, well, let's see what this looks like. <laughs> and they built, rep built replicas. And after they had one ship ready to go, they put a bunch of Roman soldiers on it and got out there and capsized. They all drowned. Well, let's try it again. Maybe we... And so eventually they learn how to sail. But most of the uh, leaky tubs, you might say, were grain ships. And they followed along where they could still see the coastline. It was much safer than in the open ocean. And part of that was following along in the uh, Adriatic Sea. And coming up to Corinth. And what they would do is they would pay to have their ships taken out of the water and they had rollers, uh, trees that they had fashioned for good rollers and they would roll those ships a few miles over land and then put them back in the water. Well, that saved them several days and the sailors had to do something during that time and so Corinth was quite a party town. Uh, there were thousands. Now, now, Corinth is down here. And the Areopagus and the fortress is up on a, a large hill. And whenever there is a danger, they will all go up to the fortress. Uh, if there's an invading army or something, there they were safe. Um, there with the... Uh, idol centers and whatnot, they had prostitutes by the thousands who came down every night into the city of Corinth. They had gambling. 
They had the Corinth Games, which was like the Olympic Games, but they were more popular than the Olympic Games. And a lot of gambling that went on. Uh, and so it, it's quite a party town, it's quite an immoral town. That's Corinth. Corinth is a wealthy town because everybody's got a job if they're willing to get out of bed because they got all these sailors coming into town. They have all of these uh, entertainment things and whatnot. And they could just get even a, a menial job if they were getting, helping to get the ships over, over land. So it wasn't a problem of having money. It wasn't like Northern Greece, Macedonia, where everybody was poor. And it was a subsistence living type of thing up there, down south. It was uh, lots of money. So Paul goes into Corinth. He left Athens, he went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius. Uh, Pontius is just, well, if you look on, you got maps in the back. Uh, Pontius was where Pilate became famous. Pilate was a uh, son of a German king. And when Rome defeated that German king, part of the peace treaty is you give me some of your kids to be raised as Romans, and that will guarantee you won't rebel because we have your children. And Pilate was just a baby when he was given to Rome. And uh, Pilate had no opportunity because he wasn't uh, an Italian. Uh, and there was no business opportunity for him. He couldn't start a business and whatnot, but he could join the army. And he did join the army. And he became, he, he went up, he advanced himself in the ranks and that was the way people uh, advanced and had something in life is they did through the military. Once you went through military training, and you, I say military training, basics, and you, were, you graduated from basics, then you could swear an oath to Rome and begin your uh, stint in the military. They would brand you under the arm, saying that this guy belongs to Rome. And then you're in for 20 years. When you joined the Roman army, it was a 20 year commitment. Most did not get married until after they were out of the military service because you know, they, were, they, they were sent everywhere. Most of the time they spent building roads for the Romans. And so it was a very boring job. But when they went and fought for Rome, they pillaged. Whoever they defeated, they took all the plunder and whatnot, and they became pretty wealthy people. And so they preferred being out fighting wars, because that's where they got their money. Pilate had risen to the place where he was a commander of a Roman legion. So he obviously had done so many things that were very uh, notable. As a, as a military man and rose in the ranks. And every time you get, you do something notable in the Roman army, you got a certain amount of money for that. And every time you rose in rank, you got more money. And so, it, and so many people did some pretty daring things because they knew it was financially advantageous. Uh, and uh, he became a commander of a Roman legion. And Pontius was a wild, wild area. And he took his legions to Pontius and defeated them and made them a part of Rome, Roman's empire. And so when they took him through the streets of Rome with his victory parade, they gave him an honorary title, Pontius Pilate. Now, he only had one name. He was a Gentile. He was an outsider. They had three names. That's where we get our three names. There's a, uh, your clan, your tribe, and then your given name. Uh, but Pilate only had Pilate. And so he just punches Pilate. Where you have uh, Scipio, Africanus, uh, Blue, or uh, Hannibar, Redbeard. 
That's what that means. And you know, you'd have, and, and when you had like Africanus, he was a conqueror of North Africa. And they would give them these different titles. Um, and they gave Pilate the title of Pontius Pilate. And that was a very honorable. He got an opportunity, and he's, he's an older man. He's, he's passed, uh, he's probably been in the military at least 20 years, maybe more. He has friends in Rome, and one of the friends get him a job being a proconsul, a ruler of an area of land for Rome. And it was in Judea. And that's how Pilate runs into Jesus and gets an opportunity to know the gospel. Now, here we have an interesting, this Aquila was a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, now there's Claudius, and the next Nero, or excuse me, and the next emperor is gonna be Nero. Claudius married Nero's mother, and Nero's mother convinced him, you ought to make uh, my son your uh, official son. And they went through a ceremony and gave him the togus virilis, and, and Nero would say, daddy, daddy, when it was all over, and everybody knew that's the next emperor. Of course, that was a terrible decision. Um, but, and then Claudius decides, I've had enough of this, I'm going to retire. And, and uh, Nero takes over. The first order of business for Nero is kill mom. <laughs> Such a nice guy. You know, he, mom had a, a real nice yacht. Um, and uh, men that would roar all over the Mediterranean type of thing, you know. And, and so he had them. Uh, he planted so he rode ma this uh, mom out and, and he all of them pulled the plugs on the, on the ship and, and head, head in the dinghies for sure. And she was taking a nap in the afternoon, you know, and all of a sudden she's in water. And so she's like 60 something or, you know, she's older. And so she uh, gets herself off the ship and swims all the way to shore several miles. Uh, she's really a tough lady, but does eventually kill mom because mom is going to, well, mom's a problem. You know, she thinks she should rule. <laughs> it's her son that she got in to be emperor and she feels like she ought to call the shots. So Nero didn't like that. Anyway, so Claudius, that's the emperor, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome because there was such difficulty and uh, infighting with the Jews over a person named Christus. That's Jesus Christ. People came in and, and talked about Jesus Christ to the Jewish people and some of them believed and some of them wouldn't. And they were fighting all the time over it. And so Claudius, he's so sick and tired of the fighting going on, he said, every Jew leave Rome. And they had to. They were ordered. They ordered all the Jews out. Uh, Paul went to see them and because he was a tent maker, now he, he does make tents, but he is a leather worker. He makes sandals also. He makes uh, uh, saddles for horses. Uh, he makes tents. He's a leather maker. And there, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And you notice what it says. He didn't start a singspiration. So we're all going to have a singspiration in Rome and, or wherever, you know, here's that in Corinth here. And that's all about everybody to sing uh, Christian songs and hymns. No. Persuasion is how he reached people. He convinced people that what the scripture said is true, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And they believed he was the Messiah and that gave them eternal life. He did not use emotional means. 
He persuaded people, and that's throughout the scriptures you'll read that. He talked to people, and they became convinced that what he said was true. Um, there was no emotion involved in it, although they might be very emotional. It says many times they were really glad they knew the Lord now. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, northern Greece, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. Now he could stop earning a living because nobody supported him. Um, none of the churches supported him. Uh, he never asked for support. That, he was proud of the fact that he did not ask people for money. He wanted to be self-supporting and do it as unto the Lord. There was one church that every now and again would send him some money. And that was the Philippian church, the Philippi church. And, you know, the cover would be bare. And uh, business isn't great because they can do some work. But every trade had their own guild. And the leather workers had a guild. The, the metal workers had a guild, etc. So if you didn't belong to the guild, you weren't in uh, the financial area. Uh, you had to do this on your own, doing peace work here and there and whatnot. So uh, when he had relief and others could earn some money, uh, he, uh, this, then he went full time, day and night, preaching the gospel. Testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, notice where the emotion comes from. It comes from the unbelievers. Now you'll find this very true today with people who are just anti Christian. They'll use some of the silliest excuses. Uh, and some people who are notable scientists say things that you think, where in the world did they get that? I mean, it just, on the surface, it's silly because they get emotional and they use their emotions and they go with their emotions, they turn off their thinking. Paul continued to think and to reason. Now, they become emotional. They cannot stand up to his reasoning. They cannot stand up to his rational thinking and convincing people that Jesus is the Savior. So they become abusive. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. If you, you Jews don't want what God has provided for you, you had first opportunity. You have the word of God. You have the background. Uh, you can search the scriptures. And you say, no, I'll go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. Now that's pretty difficult. The synagogue leader has believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Paul's just been excommunicated from the synagogue as far as the Jews are concerned. And the synagogue leader believes in Jesus Christ as his Savior. It becomes very difficult for Jewish people in, in Corinth because they reject the truth and any of us that reject the truth are going to find life to be hard. Okay, uh, the synagogue leader and his entire household believed in the Lord and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Now one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. It does get discouraging when you have lots of opposition. And Paul had been chased from town to town to town for people who hate the message about Jesus Christ. And so here's another situation where he's got opposition. Um, and he, he's already been stoned once. So it makes a person think. You know, it's not like, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, it does matter. I mean, even if God raised him from the dead, it hurt. Now, 
So God himself encourages Paul. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Okay, fear neutralizes us. He's encouraged to keep on speaking to the people about Jesus Christ. Do not be silent. It's easy just to shut our mouth and not say anything. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. There's a lot of people who are going to believe. Just give them the message. Give them the opportunity. And this is a huge city. This is one of the larger cities of, of the Roman Empire. And there's always an influx of sailors, always an influx of people who are uh, in the trades industry and whatnot. Uh, they have, they just have a tremendous amount of flow of people. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So he just said, I'm not looking for anywhere else to go. Uh, while Gallio was pro council of Acacia. Acacia is southern Greece. Macedonia is northern Greece. A united attack on Paul. Uh, the, uh, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. Notice it's the Jewish people closest to the word. First opportunity but that's the story of the Jewish people in their history. We have to realize that God chose Abraham, the man least likely to succeed. He had nothing going for him. He was an older man, he and his wife had no children. Uh, he was under the thumb of dad. And God says to him, leave your family and your country and go to a place I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna make you a great man and you're going to be a blessing to many nations to all people he is told and it took him years before he get away from dad and get down to Israel then it took him years until he could finally trust the Lord uh, enough that he was mature and uh, the promise of the son that was promised to him came true when he was a hundred years old now we decide that We'll take our time to serve the Lord. We probably don't have a hundred years, you know. <laughs> um, but, and his descendants. We're a little rebellious, you should say. I mean, uh, the Jewish people who came out of uh, Egypt. Of course, before that, he, like Jacob had his sons and, and they were a mess. They needed to be taken out of Canaan or else they're going to become just like the Canaanites. They're dishonest, they're murderers, it's just a mess. So they end up in Egypt and they're shown tremendous miracles and they're fed every day. And all their cattle that was given to them from the Egyptians, he said, take it, just leave. And all the wealth that they have, and they, and they have 10 different opportunities to trust the Lord. And they fail every one of them. And they go to Mount Sinai. And one of the opportunities to trust the Lord is he's going to give them their constitution. And they build a golden calf. Uh, so the history of the Jewish people is a history of rebellion. It's not a history of them being faithful. Uh, you go through the, the kings. Uh, First king, second king, Samuel before that, the judges. It's a constant apostasy. Then come back to the Lord and then leave the Lord. So when we see that the Jews here become full of animosity and they want to kill Paul and they plan it out and everything, that shouldn't surprise us because that's their history. They were... Who was it who insisted that Jesus be crucified? Put on the cross by Pontius Pilate. The Jewish leaders. Now that doesn't mean we have any animosity toward Jewish people. We try to witness to Jews and win Jews just as much as Gentiles. 
This message is for all people. And when you find a Jewish person who turns to Christ, they're pretty excited about that because they then fulfill the purpose for which they became a people. So, they had a united attack against Paul. They brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. So Paul's about to speak for himself. He's, you know, explain, I am not a lawbreaker and whatnot. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourself. Get out of here. <laughs> and that's true. Um... I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, an important, important name there, the synagogue leader. See, they had to change synagogue leaders because they lost one who believed in Christ. Now this synagogue leader later on leads them to try to get Paul in trouble with the law. And uh, they turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Sometimes it takes a good beating before you'll come to Christ. <laughs> I mean, you know, the people that he was doing this for and were trying to get Paul in trouble with the law and whatnot, they turned on him. Well, excuse me, you know. And he realized he needed Christ too. And as Paul said, and our brother Sosthenes, he became a believer. Most of us have had the good sense not to wait till we got beat up to believe in Christ. But sometimes people have to come to the end of the rope before they'll believe. At least they believe. Okay. Um, We're out of time. Let's see now. We'll pick it up here at verse 18. So we started late, so. Well, I don't want to end late. <laughs> I do enough of that. Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your word, which teaches a lot about people who go out and evangelize and, and care for the lost. Give us a compassion for the lost. Help our mouth to open wide respectfully that we might give the message of the good news about Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.